Welcome to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. Each week, we hear real-time stories from athletes and CEOs on how to maximize performance through an endurance mindset. Let's get started. Welcome to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. Today's guest is an avid runner, founding a running community that gave her support. Run, running is where she thinks, she dreams, she unwinds, sets and achieves goals, and tests herself. She has competed in a dozen ultra marathons and seven Ironman distance races, including the 2014 World Championship in Kona. The founder of Wear Blue, Run to Remember, please welcome Lisa Hallett. Welcome, Lisa. I'm excited to be here, Greg. Thanks for having me. It's great. I could feel your energy already. It's, it's great to have you on the show. So we focus on endurance and endurance mindset. And my, my favorite question to ask is, Lisa, tell me how your endurance mindset has impacted your life unexpectedly. You know, endurance sport is this beautiful thing, right? This community of people take on these big challenges together, right? We, we build a community working through hard. But I think that, um, you know, beyond that sense of shared suffering, which is like such a gift, endurance sport has given me patience. And, um, you know, I've been trying for years to get into Western States 100. It is apparently you can't just register. Um, but from getting into these races to setting and achieving a long distance goal, it has given me this gift of, of getting beyond instant gratification. And I think that it is a lost art in, in our, our country today. And I do say that it's an art because there is like such beauty in how we become when we work slowly, steadily toward a goal. And so at that basic level of, hey, it's going to take me years to get into this race, but I still have my eyes on that prize to training for a 5K versus training for a 100 mile race is going to take a whole different set of time parameters. And that patience, you know, really helps. It buoys me in the sport, but even more so the patience that we need in parenting, the patience we need professionally, socially, and just in life. Change physically, mentally, emotionally takes time. And when we can have patience, we can really enjoy the journey and give ourselves the space to become on the journey rather than just receiving an instance. It's really well said, Lisa. And I'd love to go a little bit deeper into making those connections between the endurance training and the lack of instant gratification and how you've applied that. You mentioned your family life, your business life, your other aspects of your life. Draw that connection for us a little bit stronger. Right. So, yeah, I'm a single parent. I have three kids and they're awesome. Um, but there is this sense of parenting where you're like, hey, we're teaching values. We're having hard lessons. You know, when they're little, it's it's the time out sitting on the steps. And when they're bigger, sometimes it's, it's you know, it's consequences and, and, and rewards too. And you, you, you don't know if you're successful, right? We dig in every day as parents and we, we cross our fingers and hope that they're going to grow up and become these kind, loving, successful, happy adults. Um, but we don't see that instantly. And it, it's sometimes just this long slog in getting there. And, and there are setbacks, right? There's no parent who said every day has been perfect. And the same is true with our training, right? I am, I, I last year I ran the Leadville 100 you know, 100 mile foot race in the mountains of Colorado. And um, it was not a straight line journey. It was, it was beautiful. I loved getting out. I'm running on the way. I'm feeling stronger. But you get that niggle in, in your knee and your hamstrings, you know, tighter than it should be. And you got to take a few days off or you think you're going to set a time goal. And so training is not a straight line. Parenting is not a straight line. Our professions are not straight lines. Um, but this journey, you know, understanding that it's going to be long and steady. And sometimes when we, really commit ourselves to that long and steady growth rather than a, a flash in the pan or, or something that's only surface level, we're able to really dig in deeper and, and entrench ourselves in success um, for those paths that we're following. So I'm curious if you have an example of a time where you found yourself in that situation where you felt stuck or just you got progressing and, and the light bulb came on and you said, you know what, this is similar to my hundred mile training run, run or this race. And I know that if I can put one more foot in front of the other, 
in whatever situation you were in that you're going to progress the following step and the following day and so on. Yeah, you know, I, I just ran a marathon last week and I had um, a big goal of of getting back to Boston qualifying. And, you know, when you do endurance sport, for me, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a strong mid-pack finisher. Um, but when you get into that longer stuff, you're focusing on, dis- I'm focusing on distance, not speed. And so running, you know, an 813 minute mile for 26.2 miles uh, had, had become a daunting challenge for me again. And so I'm out there, I am, I'm, I'm training for my race and my coach is giving me these splits that I need to be hitting. And I'm not, to be honest, I'm not even hitting the distance that I need to, because I'm trying to break up a run and pick up, you know, one kid from cross country practice, be there to cheer another kid on and, and then, you know, do live. So I've got these, these mixed up runs. I'm tired. I'm not feeling right. And I'm just not hitting. And I'm frustrated, right? It's hard to get out there and just miss the mark every time. And I talked to my friend Luke, who's in the industry as well, and he says, he's like, stop, like throw away the watch and get back to what you love. Like try to run slow. And when you think you're running slow, run slower. And it was this step to just take a step back and remember, like in the long game, you have the space to learn lessons and reconnect to where you're at. And I realized I just had to go back to my roots. Like I enjoy endurance sport because it's peaceful, it's beautiful, it's a unique challenge. And I'd gotten so focused on this, this time goal. And I was so connected to what I was missing that I disconnected from what I was getting, right? I'm getting, it fortifies me. It, it reconnects me to the earth in a world that is chaotic. And um, I needed that. And I needed endurance sport to give that to me because when I get what I need right away, I don't have the space to remember and to slow down, right? And so the same is true with work, right? Work throws life at us constantly. And I think every one of us can finish a work day and be like, well, I didn't do X, Y, Z. I really missed the mark. But if we go back to, okay, wait, why do I do what I do? Why, why am I in this industry? Why am I on this team? There's reasons bigger than the marks we're missing. Let's go back. Okay, I'm going to reconnect with what I love to do and why I love my work. And I'm going to back to the basics and I'm going to slow down. I mean, I'm going to painfully slow down. But that's when we have that new space to reconnect, rethink, re-engage and get those fresh ideas, that fresh direction, that fresh foundation so that we can again plug forward towards that bigger goal. That's a, a great lesson learned there, Lisa, about slowing down and taking it in and appreciating, you know, what's around what's around you. You know, I was at uh, Ironman Wisconsin last Sunday. And I started to swim and I instantly started to think about, okay, if I can get X amount of time in my swim and X amount of time on my bike and my transitions, and I'm already forecasting the day and I'm already starting to feel disappointed in my performance and I'm only 15 minutes into the race. And then for some reason it occurred to me, I'm like, you know what, today's going to be a product of how I did my training and it's a product of the weather and it's a product of the road conditions and it's a product of all these things that I don't have much control over now. So just enjoy the day. And all of a sudden, like this relief came across and I had a great swim time and the rest of the day was terrible, but (laughs) we said a good swim time. But to your point, that's similar, right? It's like taking the moment in the moment and saying, hey, let's just slow this down and appreciate what's around us. Yeah, 100%. It's funny. You know, I number one rule in life is never do math in public, except for I'll spend an entire race, whether it's Ironman or 100 mile doing math. Okay, if I hold this pace for X number of miles, I'll finish at that time. And I love that you let go and and had that swim that you deserved. And sorry, the rest of it was not, not quite the, what you hoped for. You're right. There's a lot beyond us that we cannot control. And so think about what can I control? Control the controllables. And it always starts with my attitude. Absolutely. So let's take that one step further. When you're on a, a long training run by yourself in the dark, how can we apply that? How do you apply that same principle? Of uh, the same principle of control the controllables? Yes. You know, one planning. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up myself up for success. So lay out, you know, lay out gear ahead of time. And then it's even thinking, of, okay, what am I thinking? What, thinking about what I'm thinking about. It's like, okay, I'm going to, you know, focus that, right? When you're out for a six, 10, 12 mile, 12 hour sometimes training day, You've got a lot of time. And so your physical preparation, okay, headlamp, extra batteries, food, 
your mental preparation. What am I listening to? What am I thinking about? Um, why am I out there? Those all matter. And so you have to physically prepare, mentally prepare. And that helps create, you know, a recipe for success on, on training and on race day. Certainly. I suspect for you, there's also an element of routine. You know, I suspect you've got daily routines, weekly routines, not just around your training, but also your family life and your work life. Can you talk to us about how routines play into your success in your distance running? Well, you know, it's funny that you say that because I have three kids. And so three kids in some ways forces routine and also forces you to throw routine out the window. Um, but I think that one of the things it's not so much routines as it is priorities. And um, for my family, the priority is a family meal. And sometimes that family meal means breakfast before we all leave for work and school or training, or sometimes it means family dinner, but it's that shared space and connecting, you know, with the human beings who I so value my time with. And um, so priorities drive that. And then within it, then, of course, doing routine things routinely um, allows success. And so that means Saturday mornings, if I don't Routines mean discipline, right? But if I don't get up when I think I'm going to get up and eat my food, let it digest, start my run in a timely manner, before you know it, a nine or 10 o'clock start for a five hour run, and I've missed the day, not just for myself, but with my kids. And so when we are, as you know, the majority of endurance athletes are busy people, right? You're juggling a lot. And it's not just the sport, um, which makes that sport even that much more of a success and that much more impressive. Um, but it's figuring out how to connect all these pieces of our lives. And so it's the discipline to be consistent in our priorities that I think really drives success. So let's rewind that to the night before. What are you doing the night before to prepare for that morning? It's, it's the, lay, the layout of the supplies and it's getting sleep, right? You know, what is the difference between an amateur and a professional? I think a lot of us would say sleep and we need it not just physically, but when we're like professionals, you know, in the workplace, mm -hmm. uh, we have to be healthy and whole to be successful. And so the night before I I'm eating right, um, I'm laying out and prepping, you know, my my nutrition, my, my hydration vest, uh, making sure if it's if it's triathlon season, making sure my my tires are ready to go and I've got spare tubes and um oxygen or not oxygen what do we put in them what are in those little canisters yeah co2 thank you yeah. also not a science major but it's you know you're putting all those things out there so that when you wake up you've simplified it right remove the variables um in there and then i'm going to bed early i also know when i plan the night before it eliminates so many excuses right because it's so easy to wake up and say oh well i should do this and i forgot my time and I wear my gloves and where's my helmet and where's this? And to your point, next thing you know, it's nine o'clock and you're just getting out on the trail and now there's more people than you want to deal with and then you're coming home late. Um, so I would find that one, the night before is a big part of the routine. And then to the point you just made about sleep, I mean, to me, it's almost like the fourth discipline in my training regimen. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent. You know, it's interesting. I ran a race, you know, last, last week and you know, I'm, I'm starting to building, but I'm recovering. And last night I went to bed an hour earlier than I normally did because I was just tired. And it's remembering to give ourselves the grace and the tools to be successful. And, and I put those two hand in hand because we, we drive ourselves and we're trying to be achievers, right? We, we set and achieve these goals and we think, okay, I'm going to spend this quality time with my kids. I'm going to get that big work proposal done. I'm going to have a killer workout and I'll just go to bed a little later. I'll wake up a little earlier. Well, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. So we got to let go of something so that we can focus on what's important and sleep has to be a part of it. And then at the end of it, when you say, oh my gosh, why am I so tired? Why can't I get it together? Hey, you just worked your heart for six hours, 10 hours, you pushed your body and you're juggling kind of the emotional intensity of racing as well while you're a professional, you're a parent, you're a friend, or you know, fill in the blanks. And so we need grace to say, hey, that was hard. You did something hard. Good for you. Let your body recover. 
And so maybe it is a light work week. It's a light training week. And maybe instead of, I don't know, climbing a mountain with your kids, you guys watch a movie. It's going to look different. And, and But if we're trying to be the best at everything, we're going to end up dropping the ball on everything. That's pretty well said. So if I'm doing my, the math correctly, you're at World Champions Kona, Championship Kona about nine, 10 years ago. I would guess your kids were probably middle age, middle a middle school age, or maybe even younger. I'm curious what your kids thought about your endurance racing, your long runs, your ultra marathons, your Ironman. Like, give us their perspective, but when they were younger, and what it is now. You know, it's. I've always really. I mean, I've spent a lot. I've had a lot of time to think about this on long runs, right? I'm away from my kids and I'm a single parent. And it, um, is that fair? Am I asking a reasonable question of them? But in the flip of that is, one, it's something that makes me whole. So when I have, feel strong and confident, I am a better parent. And I don't think we can disregard that. That's really important. Um, but I've also normalized this. And so I remember, you know, other kids are playing in the neighborhood and my daughter is she's ride her little bike with her helmet on you know she's five and she'd get off and then she'd go for a run around the block because that's how she knew how to play you practice triathlon um and so it's been um a real gift and as they've gotten older it's really woven into um how we engage as a family and so as i was training you know i've got right now it's it's fall and my oldest is a football player i've got two cross-country runners and they're faster than me. And so as I'm trying to hit splits, I'm I'm saying, okay, you're running with me today. You got the next hour. And they can come drive and they're like, mom, you could do this. And they're really encouraging. And that's the power, I think, in a lot of ways of sport. It builds compassion and mm-hmm. um, understanding and connection, right? We, we strip away the chaos of life. We strip away our barriers. And we have these common goals. And when I am raw, um, I am I'm exposed so that people can come in and then we can really see each other. And I think this is where we're really able to support and build one another up. That's fantastic. Uh, shifting gears slightly, Lisa, talk to us about you, your childhood, how you grew up, how you got into running. Um, give us a little bit of sense of who you are. Um, yeah, I went to a Catholic school growing up. Actually, I, I met my uh, husband John there. Um, I was five, a kindergartner. He was a much older second grader. And um, um, but I lived across the street from the school. And so I would um after I finished my homework, I'd put on my my really cool Walkman with my tape in it. And I'd go run, listen to, I don't know, hits of the 80s and 90s. It was very cool. And I would just run. I mean, I wasn't training for anything. I just loved listening to music daydreaming and, and moving my body. And, you know, in high school, I was a soccer player. I was a cheerleader. Um, and then in college, I trained for my first marathon. And so was, there's never this need to compete and be the winner, but always this need to move, to think. And you, some people call it visualization, right? You've got to think about the finish line. I call it daydreaming. And it's so much more fun at, to let your mind explore and explode with the possibility of, of, of victory and the possibility of possibility. And that is what movement's always given me. And so when I was in college, I, I actually lived with much more talented runners than me who were all in the cross country team. And my, at the time, boyfriend was at Ranger School, a, a challenging um, school for, for army soldiers. I said, I'm going to do something hard too. And I ran the LA Marathon with team and training. And I loved it. And so then running, setting and achieving a goal um, became the pattern of how I navigated the challenges of the military life. We'd move or John would deploy and I'd sign up for a new race and it'd be something hard that I was doing. It'd be a way for me to learn the streets and the community. Um, but it was also this really piece of self, right? You move with the military and the person, the service member, rolls right into friends, a career, a path, right? And the spouse, the dependent, is in this journey of recreation again and again. But movement was my constant um, in an inconstant state. I'd love to get into a little bit more on that. Um, 
for audience members who are spouses or partners of our military, talk to us a little bit more about that experience because I don't think we hear about it as often as we should um, of how you know families move, partners move, and you're kind of you're locked in with this military um, service person. Talk to us how it, it it's on on your side of that. It is. I, it's been a, a long time since, you know, we joined the military. My husband graduated from West Point in 2001, right? And so we had an entire military career marked by the aftermath of 9-11. And so it was this very unique journey. But I think, you know, really consistently, um, you know, we see the service member, um, right? You, you move every 18 months to three years based on your spouse's career. And so as a young newly gra- newly graduated individual, um, I was trying to build a career every 18 months to three years moving. And so it's a challenging pattern of behavior. And um, but it's evolved so much over the past two decades from when we entered. You've got some really incredible hiring efforts out there through the Chamber of Commerce, hiring our heroes. Um, you've got a lot of organizations advocating to transfer certification. You think about physical therapists, nurses, teachers, lawyers, um, right? And so if you're moving and you have a professional skill or trade and you need that certification that is state-based, um, so we really see some amazing advocacy work that's happening to empower military spouses to be able to continue their professional careers. Um, and for me, I was a teacher, you know, in those early years, I was raising a young family. And so I was able to adapt as we went. Um, but you know, the service member raises their right hand to protect and defend, but truly that military family carries the weight of that service. Sure. Sure. I'm so happy I asked. I didn't know that or appreciate it as much as I should have. Um, talk to us about Wear Blue, Run to Remember. How'd that start? What's its mission? Give us um, the lowdown on that. I yeah, see your shirts all the time. So now I get to learn a little bit more about it. Good. Alyssa, I love, we call it seeing wear blue in the wild when you see a wear blue shirt out on a race course or somewhere unexpected. Um, so just, you know, the mission of wear blue is to honor the service and sacrifice of the American military through active remembrance, right? Movement and remembering. You know, those words never forget. Um, wear blue is really what that looks like. And it's been a very personal journey for me. So John and I, right, he's in the military, he graduated at West Point. We go from Hawaii to Georgia to Louisiana to Washington. We have a couple babies on the way. Um, but in November of 2008, John took command of an infantry striker company. And then that following summer, his brigade, it's about 3,000 soldiers, were a part of that surge to southern Afghanistan. And so John's brigade deployed to the Kandahar region. And so a few weeks after John left, our daughter Heidi was born. So it was our third child. And then a few weeks later, I headed to my first military meeting. And so they'd have these meetings throughout. And um, I remember I had Heidi with me. Um, She was in our little bucket seat. She was three weeks old. And then during the meeting, I I was pulled out by our rear detachment commander, um, Frankie, and he was in charge of the, the military families who had stayed, you know, who were on the home soil where the spouses were deployed. And Frankie pulls me out and he told me, he told me that John had been killed. And I had a three-year-old, a one-year-old, and this three-week-old baby who my husband had never met. And I just knew that they were wrong. But they weren't. And um For our brigade, it became this deployment that claimed 41 lives. And so we were struggling. Um, They were our our husbands, our friends, our leaders, uh, soldiers. They were were people. They were our community. And military is like family. And so we started running together. And so the first time we met, we we gathered in the Burger King parking lot. We kind of looked at each other. And then we ran around the airfield. And we didn't know what we had, but we knew we had something. So we came back the following week. And then that time we said the names of those guys, those guys who weren't coming home. And then we ran. And, you know, we didn't come together because we loved running at that point. But we came together because of this raw need 
to connect, to heal, to remember, you know, to take control of a situation that was out of our control. And that's where Wear Blue was born. And then those guys and gals came home from that deployment and they needed all the same things we did, right? The space to heal, to connect, um, to grieve. And you just don't have words big enough. Mm -hmm. But in running, you, you don't have to have words, right? It's we were able to show up and our presence in itself said, I get it, I'm living it, and I'm remembering with you. And we really moved through not just the deployment, but the homecoming and the reintegration um, by these weekly gatherings. And so now Wear Blue is a global community. We have about 60 Saturday run communities around the world. We're in Colorado Springs, we're in San Antonio, Texas, we're at Fort Liberty in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and here in DuPont, Washington, outside of Joint Base Lewis McCord. And every week we bring together our service members, their families, our families of the fallen, our community supporters. And we always start with a circle of remembrance. We speak the names of the guys and gals who we remember. And then we run and we walk, we move. And so we carry their stories in the steps of a run as a foundation for how we will carry them in the steps of our lives. And then, um, you know, out of this, we, we have a youth mentorship program for children of fallen military. We train families of the fallen to run their first marathons. And then what many people know us best for is we build tribute miles at different races across the country. So at the Marine Corps Marathon, at the Air Force Marathon, the Rock and Roll San Antonio Marathon, we'll take a one-mile stretch with images names, ranks, ages, as requested by their friends and family, followed by the local community holding American flags in honor of each of those heroes. You're, uh, yeah, anyway, I because I have run Marine Corps Marathon and you go around Haynes Point and you make that turn and you're kind of at this desolate part of the run course already and you get this overwhelming sense of pride and gratitude um it's awesome anyway so thank you for that um because it makes an impact on me and it makes an impact on on this community um i'm curious lisa from those efforts and from this community that you've built or helped start building what other sort of unexpected going back to my original question like what other unexpected things have happened in your life or in the community's life that you've seen come together because of this initiative that was that you orchestrated so many years ago so like back to that very first question like like what have i learned what have you seen people are good i know that seems obvious but in a world of of sensational news like every day from a personal journey to to wear blue people are good and kind and want to do the right thing and they want to take care of other people and that is so beautiful to see and i think um this weekend we were at the air force marathon and there's a gentleman jim he's in his 80s and his brother captain mulaney was killed in vietnam in 1970 and and time has really kept jim from being able to walk the course of the miles so we brought his tribute poster right to him and he took that tribute poster and he put it in the front seat of the car. And for the first time in 50 years, Jim got to drive home with his brother at his side. And it wasn't just, you know, the dozens of people holding American flags. For the steps of that mile, there were 8,000 Americans who remembered Captain Mullaney with his brother, Jim. And that is really, really beautiful. And I see... You know, in our Gold Star Race program, these these families who have who carry the weight of sacrifice, who have every right to be broken, make the choice to live inspired by life rather than broken by tragedy, and they set and achieve a big, scary goal. They don't love running. They're not, you know, people aren't not everybody's like us. It's like running all day is a great idea. You know, maybe running a 5K seems in impossible to them but they say i'm in it and i'm doing it for my loved one and i'm doing it for me and so that fight to be more than the hard that they faced is this really incredible gift and we live that metaphorically in endurance right every moment you have to make the choice to say i'm harder i'm harder than the step i'm 
tougher than this moment. I am tougher than the tough that this course is going to give me. It fortifies us. It edifies us. It makes us a stronger, better version of ourselves. And when we get to choose the hard, we are more prepared for when life gives us hard. And so it's really incredible to see that lived in these surviving families. They've been given hard. Now they're going to choose hard. And this combination of overcoming insurmountable hard propels them this really extraordinary version of self. And I think we witness that time and time again on the race course. Um, And I get to so uniquely witness this um, by such an incredible population um, through my work with Wear Blue Run to Remember. That's fantastic. Um, How can an audience member get involved with wear blue or contribute give us some of the social media like how how can the audience members get in get involved yeah no right it's it's one percent of our our nation serves in the military actually less than on behalf of all of us um but i think we all know somebody who has served in the military and and i've seen that we are a grateful nation and we want you to be a part of this wear blue community so step one visit wear blue run to remember dot org and and learn about our programs and you'll click programs and find a race near you at the chance you can run in blue you can volunteer and hold an american flag and in honor of a fallen hero um you can also find one of our saturday run communities show up um you most communities meet about once a month first saturday of the month and it's it's such a wonderful gathering place we all need community so speak a name learn a story and meet a new community member. And then, of course, we run through the generosity of our donors. And, um, and it enables us to honor the fallen, support their families, and build inspiring community across the country. And we'll certainly include all those links um, in the show notes. So, Lisa, shifting gears slightly, are you training for... You said you, you ran a marathon last weekend. Is that... A stepping stone for uh, something you're training for or give us sort of what yeah. the next 12 months looks like for you? I always think I was just talking to a friend who just finished his first Ironman. And, you know, I, when you've done one, it's something you've done. When you do multiple ones of them, it's part of who you are. And so when you have that mentality, that means that the finish line of one race is, is, is truly just the starting line for your next race. Right. And that means recovery and then rebuilding. And so I am, I'm going to run the JFK 50 miler in November. Um, we've got a great Wear Blue crew who will be tackling the course out there. And then, you know, I've, I've, I'm not done with hitting this BQ. I missed it. I missed it by four minutes this last time. And so we'll do some speed play. And then I think the spring will mean Gorge Waterfall 100K. And so I still have my eyes on one day running Western States. And if you want to run Western States 100, you have to keep your name in the lottery. You got to keep running a 100K or 100 mile race. Wow. And I thought Iron Man was tough. Um, Lisa, how can people get in touch with you? What's your you favorite know, social media platform? Follow me on, on Instagram or LinkedIn. It's just my name, Lisa Hallett. Uh, find me on Strava. I love seeing the beautiful courses that people are swim, bike, running, or, or rowing, or moving. Um, but it's a community, and, and I think there's something really special about individuals who seek to be more through physical moment. Fantastic. And I'm assuming Run Blue will be at the Marine Corps Marathon at the end of October? That's right. We will be at Haynes Point again at the Marine Corps Marathon. Um, it's about mile 13 of the course. We'll probably have about 500 images of, of fallen service members. And each of those images are requested by someone running the race or volunteering on the course. We'll have Hundreds of volunteers out there holding American flags. Um, But it's a very special race this year because Rosie Gagnon is going to use the Marine Corps Marathon as the first leg of a 100-mile race. And Rosie is running 100, 100-mile races to raise awareness about suicide prevention. Uh, She lost her son, Dexter, in 2018 by suicide. He's a Marine Corps veteran. Um, and she's on this really powerful journey. And so we're inviting the community, please come hold a flag with Rosie or join our virtual challenge, the Warrior 100, and make a commitment to moving the equivalent of 100 now through Rosie's finish line on October 30th. 
That's a, man, my wife's running that race, so I'll definitely have an eye out for it and and look for Rosie's story. Um, and certainly we'll include it in our show notes. Um, at least it's been awesome having you on the show. I, I loved our conversation that what you just said about how your finish line is really the starting line of your next race. <laughs> like, it's so true. I'm already thinking about what should I be doing in six months? What should I be doing in nine months? Um, and I really enjoyed your insights around how movement makes you think and, and the concepts around daydreaming. And it's not just the, the, that you do for 14 hours to try to come up to your finishing time. It's truly just a chance to sit there and daydream and think, and that movement gets your body rolling. Um, and then just the overall gratification I ha have for you and the community. Um, it's been fantastic having you on the show. Thank you again. Um, listeners, if you've got some insights and some benefit from this show, please subscribe, please share it with your community. This is how this message uh, gets expanded and how we can really have an impact is by us talking about the things that we talked about on our show today. So again, Lisa, one final thank you. It's been amazing having you on our show. Greg, thanks so much for letting me share my family, this Wear Blue community, and the opportunity to talk about my favorite subject, endurance sport. And congratulations on Wisconsin. Check. Nice work. Check. Yeah, now it's the next one. The rear view mirror is so far behind already. But I know. We're endurance athletes. We're lost without a goal. <laughs> Thank you again. All right. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. To hear more inspiring stories and strategies around the endurance mindset, be sure to subscribe below or visit us at chiefenduranceofficer.com. Until next time, keep pushing those limits.